we find ourselves right in the heart of the story of Joseph. The first kind of movement in this trilogy was when he was the favorite and he was attacked by his brothers, sold into slavery. And now we find Joseph who has resisted temptation. Potiphar's wife, his master's wife, came to him again and again. And he would not take her, and he wouldn't be with her, and she ended up accusing him wrongly. He goes to prison, and that's where we pick up our story today. We find ourselves in the middle of this story preparing to um, unpack what it is to be forgotten. Now, I don't know about you, right, but, but I've been left places when I was little. I was left a place one time. My parents are great parents. They left one of their children, and they only had two. So... Um, <laughs> But let me just ask, like, you've probably been on a road trip as a family. Let me ask this. Let's see if we have integrity in the room. Anybody here ever leave a kid somewhere, like drive off? There we go. There's honesty at second service. First service was like, no, praise God, we'd never do that. You know, and then their kid's like, you're lying, mom. Um, <laughs> like, you're on a road trip, and you get, you know, you get beef jerky and, and your drinks and stuff, and everybody gets back in the car, and little Johnny's going to the bathroom. He comes out, and he's like, alone. You know, like, everybody's gone, and you're like three miles down the road, and you're like, hey, Johnny. You know, and you have that moment, like, turn the mom's voice drops, turn the car around and go get our youngest, and you go back, and you pick the child up, and you're like, sorry that we forgot you, right? That, that happens. That happens, and I know right now with little Harlan, you're like, no way. Have a couple more, and it'll happen. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. If you do it with just one, then that is on you, but, um, <laughs> but, but the reality is we get forgotten. Things get forgotten. I know that Erica has been like, hey, do you mind grabbing a gallon of milk at the store? You got it. I get home with breath mints, toothpaste, um, hairspray or something, a few other things, some of those Snyder's pretzel bits, hot buffalo wing flavored. And I show up and I'm like, yeah, I got this stuff. She's like, where's the milk? I'll be right back. I forgot it. And you know, you head right back to the store because you're maybe I'm not bright, right? You forget things. The reality is, is scripture doesn't overlook the reality of being forgotten. We're going to talk about it today and we're going to start by reading through Genesis 40. Um, follow along with me. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry. Pharaoh and the king are one and the same, by the way. He was angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, the same prison where Joseph was confined. And just a little tidbit, remember, Potiphar was the captain, the, he, this was Potiphar's prison so for Joseph. But that's where they were confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he served them. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream. On the same night, each dream had a meaning of its very own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. They looked sad. And Pharaoh's officials, so he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream, and he said to him, in my dream, I saw a vine in front of me, and on the vine were three branches. That as soon as it budded, it blossomed, its clusters ripened into grapes, and Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cup bearer. That jumped to verse 14. All right, so I'm going to go to this. Um, what we have to do is, is just understand real quick, this is a really kind of cool thing. This idea that Joseph has interpreted this dream and made it alive for him. And Joseph has, has interpreted faithfully this dream, pointing them to God. And then we see this, turn, this turnabout. It's kind of a hinge point of the story where we see an interesting characteristic of Joseph emerge. And we'll talk about it later. later. So the chief baker saw that, that Joseph had given a favorable interpretation, and he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. And this is what it means, Joseph said. The three baskets are three days. So you can see the, the baker's like, yes, 
Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head, impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat you. Like, can I have an option B, right? That's a, this is such bad news. Now, on the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. That's biblical saying Pharaoh had a birthday party for himself. I love that. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. I don't know about you, but if I'm in the clink and I think I'm gonna die and some and I have a bad dream and my buddy, the baker, has a bad dream and I get the favorable interpretation, I think I'm gonna want to, well, I'm gonna want to do what Joseph asked of him in verse 14. When all this goes well with you, remember me, show kindness, mention me to Pharaoh, and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. That's what Joseph asked him, and he forgot him. He forgot him. How do you forget a story like that? How do you forget that story? Let's say he just forgets that he had that dream and it came true in the interpretation. How do you forget the story of a young man who was beaten savagely by his brothers, thrown into a pit, drawn out of the pit, then falsely accused by Pharaoh's wife after he had risen through the ranks? Now he's in prison. How do you, how do you just forget and go back to your life without that? See, what we have to do is understand that there is this reality for us, that what happens in this story is really revelatory. It reveals human nature in its kind of worst sense. Human nature is one to be completely self-centered. We constantly are fighting for us and for me. I got to get mine. And this mentality is in this story. This guy forgets Joseph's life. He forgets Joseph, what he did for him, and that he's wrongly imprisoned. He knew the character of Joseph. And what we realize in this story is that it is wrong, and it is broken, and it is reflective more of us than anything else. We are those kind of self-centered people. But the reality we have to look at is what got the baker and the cupbearer into prison is probably similar to what happens when, and I'm going to use Applebee's because they're big enough to sue us if they don't like my story, which they're not going to like my story. Um, so Applebee's, you go to Applebee's, you order an appetizer, a salad, and an entree. Have you ever had it where you're sitting there and the waters and the, and the drinks never come and eventually they bring like a salad and then your appetizer and you're like, okay, can we get our drinks? Oh yeah, they bring them out. And then right after you take your first bite of salad, which has ranch instead of blue cheese, and you're like, oh my word, you know, you're just sitting there like, come on. And right as you're about to start eating your salad, they bring your steak. And you're like, no, you know what? And it's cooked all wrong. It's medium well, which is a sin against steak. And you're like, no, no, take it back. I don't want it. Has anybody ever had that experience at a restaurant? Yeah, you have. And, and like being Dutch, what do you do? You don't say anything. You just don't tip them. <laughs> Boo, you should tip them, even if they do poorly. Okay, you know, or, or you do the worst thing. I'm going to leave a gospel track because they need God. That was not good service, you know. Don't do that. And don't ever leave anything with a foundry on that. Okay, just don't. Um, but what probably happens in this instance is being the chief cupbearer is the person who has access to Pharaoh through all that he eats and drinks. It would have been the primary means of assassinating a king in the ancient world. You poison his drink or his food, and the cupbearer would have been the person who brings all of it to Pharaoh. He would have been the one who was responsible. Pharaoh probably had a really bad dining experience. I don't know what happened, it doesn't say, but he ends up really unhappy with the guy who served the food and the guy who cooked it. And they end up in prison, and they're sitting there wondering what's next. And what happens is in prison, we find this interesting thing happens. Joseph serves them. And when we think about that, it should kind of boggle our mind. What has happened to Joseph all his life by people in authority? His brothers, he was the youngest. What did they do? They were savagely cruel. They sold him. They sold him. So when Joseph had people over him, his example continually was deception 
and brutality. Potiphar's wife imprisoned him falsely. His brothers sold him. Joseph has been dealt a bad hand time and again, but what did Joseph do? He did for them what they usually did for the king. He served them. He did not use his position to get more. He served those who were below him. And he gives us a beautiful example of what true character is. It's not doing to you has been, has been done to you. It's actually serving in a costly way that reflects the character of God. We see this in Joseph. He doesn't use his, his position for his own gain. He serves when he could have, well, he could have just gotten the job done. He could have done just, just enough and gotten it done. But in the next thing we see that Joseph actually cared enough to take notice of these guys. He didn't just have a checklist. He didn't just have this way. He's like, all right, you're still alive. Tick, you know, hey, cupbearer, tick. No, he walks by and he sees a difference in how they looked. He could tell the difference between a good night's sleep and a bad one. They looked dejected. They look dejected and sad. And here's the reality. There is um, some psychological studies, a number of them have been done on like young teenage, adolescent teenage boys, and they actually have emotional blindness. And, and it's a real thing. They will hold up a picture of a person who's like, and they'll be like, I'm happy. And they hold up a picture of the same person doing this. And they're like, I don't know, happy. Have you ever had that? Like where you're talking to your kid and you're like, do you hear the words coming out of my mouth? And you're like turning red and you're kind of freaking out as a good parent often does. And you're like, what are you doing? And you do that and they're like, no. Uh. And you're like, don't you grunt at me, <laughs> right? They actually, the testosterone, different things have made them a little bit blind, a lot bit blind to expression. You can have a teenage boy see something that would break your heart and they're just like, no. Uh. There is an emotional blindness that goes on, and it's real, and Joseph fought through it. He doesn't give in to just being like, yeah, whatever. It says he looked at them and saw that they were dejected. He saw beyond what was easiest, and he did what was necessary. What about you? Do you notice when your coworkers look heartbroken? Do you notice when your friends look sad, detached, or upset? Do you come home from work and pick up on cues that maybe your children have had a really rough day in the grind of elementary, middle, or high school? Do you come home and have your radar up and not emotional blindness that says, I just gotta get through dinner, get to the bedtimes, and then there's some peace and quiet? Do you stop and take notice of how people look? I'm not the best at this as a, as a dad. I think I've shared this before, but um, you know, I'll pick my daughter Bella up, and Bella and I have a similar sense of humor, and we have a lot of fun together. We'll like laugh, and we we just have a hoot. It's great. And Bella will get in the car. I'm like, "What up, boo?" And she's like, "Hey, dad." And we talk, and we laugh, and we we're always laughing about something, and we're having a good time. And we'll get home, and the door opens. I'm like, "All right, go on in." She's got a little backpack, cute as ever, and in she goes. And um, Erica will say, "What's wrong?" And she'll be like, I don't know, it's just like that. And I'm like, we were just laughing. She's fine. What are you, why? Are, yeah. I just walk out, clunk. And I'm like, I don't, I missed all the signs. And on one glance, Erica can be like, are you okay? No, not really. My heart's like this, you know. And I was like, how did I miss it? Joseph didn't miss it. Do you ask? See, it's dangerous to ask. We in this culture will be like, how are you doing? People start to tell us, not that interested. And on you go, right? <laughs> You're like, how's it going? Nope, don't answer. I've got places to be, you know? I've got to be somewhere. But Joseph asked them, why do you look so sad? Why do you guys look so sad today? He took the time and then he listened. This is an art rapidly dying in our culture, is the art of listening. If you're talking to someone like, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, what I just say? Uh-huh, yeah, totally. You know, and, they, and they're totally disconnected because if it's about 10 seconds, you're like, yeah, I'm checking out. I'm not gonna listen. But Joseph took time and he listened to them. He took the time and gave them his time, his energy, and his emotional effort and listened. And once doing that, this is the, the critical reality. He pointed them to God. Do you notice these guys are like, we had, I mean, it's kind of funny. We had bad dreams last night, you know. We don't like our dreams. And he's like, oh, well, don't all interpretations belong to God? 
He had them in the palm of his hand. He had grown men telling him about their bad dreams. Have you ever thought of that? Like, guys, do you ever go to work and be like, hey, Carl, I had a night terror. <laughs> no, nobody does that. Like, what? think of the emotional state. Joseph had them right there in the palm of his hand. And what does he do? He doesn't say, hey, let me tell you what's going on. Because, you know, I'm kind of close to God. He'll talk to me. No, he completely moves them away from him, and he puts them in God's hand. He says, doesn't God own all interpretations? Tell me your dreams. He knows his role, but he points them to God. We need to pay attention to the fact that Joseph trusted that God had the answers to what troubled them. The question for you is, do you point the people in your life to God for answers? Do you point those who are dejected and sad and down towards God for the answers? Or do you sit there and want to find an answer and fix it? and repair it for them. When maybe God's not interested in repairing it right now, he's interested in getting them on their knees. Maybe, maybe we should start pointing people back to the one who has the answers and has the right time to give them. But the other thing is, do you pray for them? And this is a huge um, brokenness in our culture, and I don't live in other cultures, so I'm gonna name ours. If you come up to somebody in this church and you open your heart to them nine times out of 10, what will they say? Oh man, that's really tough. I'll pray for you, right? I'll pray for you, which is kind of Christian code for I'm leaving now, and I, I, I'll, I'll pray for you, but I, I'm, I'm stepping back now. What if we pray for them right there? And we quit making excuses that we'll do it later, and we live in the awkward tension that people need to be pointed towards God, and sometimes visibly and presently so in the moment. We just stop and we pray for him. And we lift up to God what is God, what, it's on God's heart. That burden for them, God has a burden for them. He wants to be with them. And if we would stop saying, I'll pray for you and say, can I pray for you? Most people would be like, whoa, I didn't need you to go all Pentecostal on me. You're like, you better stop. I'll hold my hand out, right? But like, just pull them close. Say, can I pray with you? Can I just pray for you? And you lift up to God what they've just said. It tells them this, that you know how to listen. You've listened to their aches and pains, and you're not saying you have the answers. You're just trying to walk with them to the one who does. Joseph did this beautifully. So don't just say you'll pray for him. Do it. The next thing is we know this. Joseph told the truth, and quite often the truth can be a tough thing to tell. When we love someone, it means we know we have to tell a hard truth sometimes. It means we know we have to speak honestly about the things in front of us. We can't sugarcoat everything so everybody feels good. Sometimes we have to tell the hard truth. How do you think it felt? Don't you think Joseph wished the baker had gone first? Always better to end on the cupbearer who doesn't get his head chopped off and eaten by birds, right? Or would you, maybe you'd rather do it the way he did. I don't know. It seems hard to have to say to one guy, Look, in three days, you're actually going to be restored to your position, and you're going to be an official in Egypt with Pharaoh's ear and be close to him again in three short days. How awesome. And the baker's like, ooh, pick me next. This is awesome. You're getting eaten by birds. Oh, that's not as good. But Joseph told the truth. He didn't sugarcoat it, and he didn't play around. God gave the interpretation, and here's the thing. Truth just is. It is not objective. Truth is, and sometimes God gives us a hard word to say to somebody, and we want to be nice, and we don't want to hurt feelings, but maybe God's trying to rattle the cage a little, and we have to be truthful. I have people ask me quite often, do you think that's a sin? And what they want, what they're asking is, give me an out. I have lost friends and close relationships, not because I was mean, but because I had to speak the truth, and it's lame. And it's hard. I have had people speak a hard truth into my life. I don't like it that much, but in the end, I desperately love it because the truth sets you free. And Joseph knew how to tell the truth in love. So we look at Joseph. He did everything right. If this was a ministry class, Joseph did everything good and right. He served, he cared, he asked the right questions, he pointed them to God, and he told the truth when it was hard. So he got an A plus in the class and they forgot him. 
They forgot him completely. Joseph was completely forgotten. He was completely ignored. He did everything right, and then everything that he had done well kind of died on the vine. And he sits there broken and frustrated. Can you imagine the sense like, are you kidding me? I'm still here? I've done everything right, but we never see that of Joseph. We never see Joseph shaking his fist at God. Let me ask you a question. Have you been there? Have you done everything that is right and only found people to be disloyal or mean or just forget you? Have you worked to your last ounce of strength and patience only to have someone swoop in at the last minute and snap up all the credit for the project, the effort of the work that was done? Have you ever had somebody gossip, slander, or destroy you when you had only been a faithful friend? It's a biblical pattern that people who have that are often living godly lives. It does happen. But the question we often wrestle with, is it worth it? Is it worth it to live that kind of life? Is it worth it to be beaten up, sold by your brothers, tricked by, you know, like tried to be seduced by Potiphar's wife, then have noble character, not give in to the temptation and the lust, then get falsely accused, thrown into prison, help out two guys who were in a hard spot, be faithful there and say, all he said was just remember me, remember me. Is it worth it to go through all that and then have someone forget you? I think in the economy of the kingdom of God. It is. I think it's worth it. And I want to pivot us towards Jesus because Joseph is a type. He's a foreshadowing of who Christ would be. There's no sin attributed to Joseph in Scripture. We know he was sinful, but there's no sin attributed to him. His, his, his way of being reveals something true of who Christ would be. And I want you to look at it maybe through the Lord Jesus Christ's lens. There was a certain day when Jesus stood before a crowd of people. And in that crowd were mothers whose children had been healed by Jesus Christ, were people who had been stranded on a hillside in the hot Middle Eastern sun had been fed by Jesus Christ. There were blind people looking on who couldn't see before they met Jesus. There was lepers who were once outside the community standing in it now because they were healed. There were people, brothers and sisters who knew their friends or their siblings had been um, demon possessed and Jesus had cast the demons out. And all of a sudden across that crowd, the word is said, crucify him. Crucify him. Think with me, is it worth it? When we look at it through the lens of Jesus Christ, is it worth it? When the echoes begin to bounce off those stone walls, crucify him, crucify him. People who knew Jesus, people who had received good from Jesus, people who had been loved by Jesus, people he served when he was too tired to walk, said crucify him, crucify him. And they called out and out till Pilate picked up a dish and washed his hands of it and said, his blood's on your hands, not mine. And he walked away. And they crucified the Lord Jesus Christ at the voice of those who had been his beneficiaries. Is it worth it? And I will tell you this, it is. Because Jesus Christ never put his trust in us. He knew us. He knew how fickle we were. He knew how quick we are to turn. Jesus knew what was in man. It actually says that in John 2, 23 to 25. It says, now... When he, Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, didn't entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. He knew how fickle, how quick to betray, and how untrustworthy human, the human heart is. We are deceitful deep down. We will get ours and walk away. Jesus knew it, and he didn't trust us. And the reality is, he didn't hope in man. He trusted in his heavenly Father's plan and served only God. He trusted in his heavenly Father's plan and served only God, which asks us, makes us ask this. Doesn't it really come down to who you're serving then? Doesn't it just come down to one truth? Who are you serving? Colossians, written by the Apostle Paul, says it this way. Whatever you do, 
Work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. It all comes down to who you are serving. We serve not each other, but the Lord Jesus Christ. Our service may be to one another, but deep down our heart motivation is to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. It all comes down to answering the question, who do you serve? If you're serving people in this church, so you think, well, maybe Pastor Eric will like me. Can I just forewarn you that I'm one of the world's greater disappointments and I will fail you? I am just gonna tank it. It's not gonna go well if you're working for my approval because A, it doesn't mean much and B, I may never actually see. I don't know. Don't do it for my approval. Don't lead worship with Justin for his approval. Don't serve in children for Lisa in business or anything for Heidi or Lisa in the kitchen and hospitality. Don't do it for anyone. If you're doing it for them to like you, to respect you, they will disappoint you. Friends, family, etc. We don't serve anyone but Jesus Christ. You will, if you're serving others, you will end up jaded and hurt and wounded because people often take. Humanity often fails the test. Jesus Christ knew what was in the heart of man. So if you want people to like you, to respect you, to be loyal or even love you, you're going to be disappointed. But we're not finished quite yet. We're not finished quite yet. We call to serve everyone as though we're serving Jesus. Because it says this, these are the words of Jesus out of the gospel of Matthew when he says, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these, uh, of the least of these brothers and sisters, you did it for me. What Jesus is saying is, I don't forget. I don't let things go unnoticed. The world will, but Jesus Christ will never let the things we do go unnoticed. He doesn't forget. He will reward. He is loyal. He loves you, so serve him. Serve him who has always been faithful in spite of you. We have to understand the high calling of the church is service to Christ, never to this church, never to any church, any organization. We serve Jesus, and this may be the vehicle by which we do it. You don't give a dime to the Foundry Church. When you give, you give to God. You give your time, treasure, and talents to him who first gave his own life for you. And we seek to be faithful in our witness of God in all that we do, but the reality for you and I is that the promise of Jesus stands as a stark contrast to the reality Joseph faced. Joseph was forgotten after he did everything right. He served, he cared, he asked questions, pointed them to God, told hard truths. It sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? And he was forgotten. He was forgotten. You and I will be forgotten. But how amazing would it be if when we leave, people say, There's something missing like a sweet spirit has left, like the spirit of God had just been on your life through your service, and that's what's missing when we leave. Not us, but the sweet presence of God with one of his servants. That would be awesome. We don't do this for the accolades of humanity. We do this because we know the one whom we serve is the one who served us first. Unless we forget he was bruised for our iniquities. He was crushed for our sins. By his stripes, we are healed. He first loved us. So we serve him with the guaranteed promise that he has not only served our eternal need, but he will meet us in this life by his Holy Spirit and lead us as we serve faithfully and advance his kingdom. No man's agenda, only the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Serve him who has always been faithful to you, faithful to you even when you were not. Pray with me. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the word of God. Thank you that it speaks into our lives. And thank you, God, for those of us who have maybe been forgotten, we've been overlooked, or maybe we've just been missed on life scales and no one is taking note of what we do. God, I pray today that a special gift and blessing would be reminded to all who serve in quiet ways, to all who serve in loud ways, to all who serve you, that you don't forget, you don't fail to notice that you, the God who is just and good and loving, you remember. So God, remind us 
that we are not bound to the service of one another. That is a slavery we could never win at. So God, we reject it and we grab on to the truth for those of us who, who claim Christ that we are not bound to be servants and rejected by you. But you, Lord Jesus Christ, have promised that you love us, that you have redeemed us, and you've called us according to your purposes in this world. May we serve freely and hopefully in the light and the truth that you, Lord Jesus Christ, are the bright center of it all. And there is no purpose in this life apart from faithful service and relationship to you, our Lord, our Savior, our confession, and our hope, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I'm convinced that Jesus Christ loved his disciples. He loved those guys. He ate with them. They all bunked together as they went and did ministry. I think Jesus loved them dearly. And at one point on the night that he was betrayed, he looked at them and he said, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Translation, people will fail you. Life's not going to be the best, but take heart. I have overcome this world. We serve a God who does not bend the knee to the troubles of this life. He actually uses them to bring about his kingdom. So I want to encourage you. I want to call you to a life of service to Jesus Christ who takes all the ashes, all the brokenness, all the illness, all the failures, all these things that congeal into this mass of ugliness and he redeems them in the blood of Christ and calls you his own and makes purpose out of the darkness. We do not serve a God who fails to remember his covenant with us. He will always seek his people. He will always redeem his people. And he will always make use of our lives to do one thing, to extend the kingdom to those who don't yet know. So by all means, know that you are loved. Know that there'll be struggles. But know this, you are called to serve unabashedly and joyfully the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know where. Hopefully there's some stuff here. But in the end, that really doesn't matter. It's this, do you serve Jesus Christ with the life you live? That is a question for you to answer. And as you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and be gracious to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. My friends, it is time for the church to leave the building. You are dismissed.